All right, there we go. We are ready to get started tonight, starting a new series on the promises that we can find in Scripture, promises of the Bible. And uh, we look at this very first promise of Scripture. Well, it's not the first promise of Scripture, but uh, the first one that we'll look at tonight is uh, the promise of answered prayer. Uh, the promise of answered prayer. And so we start tonight in James chapter 5 and uh, verse number 16 where the Bible says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for, excuse me, pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Father, I pray that tonight you'd help us as we uh, consider uh, this first, um, the, the promise of you um, that, that you've given to us, Lord, that you will hear our prayers and that you will, um, that you'll answer. And the Lord, I pray that we would be uh, attentive here to your word and consider the conditions upon which you um, you give this promise. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, just, just give us wisdom here tonight, Lord, and give us these next few moments of fellowship here in your word, that it would be sweet fellowship as we commune also with you. We pray things in, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. All right. So um, the Bible often um, the, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, right? So, um, so we need to pay very close attention in the New Testament whenever someone from the Old Testament is mentioned, um, and especially when they're given as an illustration of a particular truth or, uh, or characteristic. So, and this is the case that we find here with Elijah mentioned in James chapter number 5. Um, he's used in James 5 as an example of someone who prayed and then got his prayers answered by God. And so we move then to 1 Kings chapters 17 and 18 and uh, to, to follow the rest of this story here, turning way back in the Old Testament uh, to 1 Kings chapter 17 and chapter 18 is where the story takes place. And uh, for us, illustrating this, his prayer life. So Elijah prayed for many things. He prayed for rain. He prayed for fire. He prayed for food. And uh, he prayed for the life of a child. And God answered all of these prayers. So let's look at this story here, uh, the story to be told. Um, how did Elijah pray? Elijah prayed yeah, absolutely. He prayed prayed earnestly that it would not rain. In 1 Kings 17, 1, um, this, this earnestness is revealed to us in this phrase, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. All right, so Elijah the Tishbite was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand there shall not be dew nor rain, but according to my word. So he had earnestly sought the Lord's um, uh, the Lord's heart on this. All right, we'll see more on this uh, on this later. Elijah stayed with the widow for whom God had provided uh, during this uh, during this famine, this um, this this period of time with with no rain on the earth. Right. So he says in verse number nine, um, "Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Um, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee." You drop down to verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the, bar the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until that day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So what a tremendous thing. Wouldn't it be great if, uh, if you didn't have to do any grocery shopping? <laughs> you just knew it was all taken care of. Um, everything done. Um, what, a great, uh, what a great promise. So, so what does Elijah do? Um, here in verses 17 through 24, he does two things. Number one, Elijah cried out and prayed, very simply, right? He, he cried out and he prayed to God on behalf of the widow's son who had died. Now, I think of it. Here's, here's God who's commanded Elijah to go 
uh, to go stay with this widow and her son. And uh, Elijah gets there and he says, all the food's provided, no problem. But then the son dies. And, uh, and so you can imagine the heart of Elijah as he goes to God and says, what, uh, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> um, you know, did, did you send me here to just, um, just, just for this time? So he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched forth himself, stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And um, so an incredible, uh, just an incredible thing. Here's Elijah praying for um, this, uh, this child to be um, brought back from, from death, and God heard even that prayer. So um, in chapter 18, we meet a lovely young man by the name of Ahab, um, who is um, not really lovely, all right? He's the king of uh, Israel during this time. Um, who, does, uh, who does King Ahab blame for this famine? Yeah, absolutely. He, he blamed Elijah, but what does Elijah say? What was the problem um, that caused this famine? Yeah, it's the idolatry. So Ahab blamed Elijah, but Elijah's very clear on this. It's due to the people's idolatry. In 1 Kings 18, down verses 17 through 19, um, came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and number two, has followed Balaam. So, Number one, you've ignored what God's told you to do. And number two, you're following a, a false god. You, you're, you are um, committing, you're involved in this, this idolatry. That's why the people have to go through this. And, uh, and so, um, so they have this, uh, this, this plan, right? Elijah and Ahab and Israel... And all the false prophets determined to prove who is God then. We'll put the gods to the test, right? Battle of the ages. We'll put the gods to the test. And, um, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, and so what, uh, what happens? Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. Elijah came unto all the people and, um, and said, How long halt ye between two? Um, between two opinions, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word, nothing. They had nothing that they could say, right? Their people answered him, not a word. Um, so there was no commitment either way on, uh, on is, is the one true living God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or is it Baal? And they said, hmm. So, uh, so now, so now we have these these issues here. So, what's the uh, so what's the plan? If you're familiar, if you're not familiar with this uh, with this account here, this story, um, Elijah says, "All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build build a couple altars here." And uh, whichever God can have the fire come down and consume the sacrifice, that will be the true God. All right? So whoever answers by fire is going to be God. And so in, a fee, in first verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 24, um, Elijah sits back and says, All right, you go first. <laughs> uh, Call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the, pe an all the people answered and said, That's, that sounds like a good plan. Now, they, didn't have the, uh, they didn't have the courage, the gumption, the backbone to stand up and say, Well, we know who God is. There's only one, one true living God, so we know that's the God of Israel. Um, they didn't say that. 
But Elijah said, all right, we're going to put them to the test. Whichever God shows up, that'll be God. That's when they spoke. That's when they said, oh, okay, all right, yeah, we can do that. And uh, so, the, um, uh, so, so all of these false prophets of, uh, or the prophets of Baal, false prophets, but of Baal, um, boy, they, they went to town and they um, did all, all sorts of things. And uh, Baal, of course, can't make fire come down from heaven. And uh, so Elijah prayed. And what, ha- are we all cut up this far? Yeah. We'll make some, make some room here on the board for us. And uh, so Elijah prayed, and what happened? God sent down, so now here's Elijah going, okay, here's what we're going to do. You've had your chance, and Baal didn't answer, all right? So uh, we, we're going to make this sacrifice, build this altar, get the wood and everything. Now dump some water on it. Dump some more water on it. Dump some more water on it. They dumped water on it till it was completely soaked, and there was this trench of water all the way around it all the way around that altar, and Elijah prayed, and God sent down fire from heaven, consuming not only the sacrifice, but that trench of water that was surrounded, uh, that surrounded that sacrifice as well. And so it came to pass in the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned, uh, that thou hast turned their heart back again. And so Elijah prays this short prayer, and sure enough, God sends down fire and, uh, and consumes the sacrifice and consumes all of the, uh, all of the water. And uh, so then after this, uh, Elijah, goes, uh, Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel and he prays again for the Lord to send the rain. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and God does. Uh, in verse 41, Elijah says to Ahab, hey, you might want to head back to the house because there's a sound of abundance of rain, right? And uh, like verse 45, it came to pass in the meanwhile... The heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And uh, Ahab robe went to Jezreel. And so, um, so that's kind of the story, right? This is um, this is what we this is what Scripture tells us t- has taken place. All of these things, um, Elijah prayed, and it stopped raining, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Elijah prayed. And, uh, and God met his provision. Elijah prayed, and uh, God raised a child from the dead. Elijah prayed, and fire came from heaven to prove not that Elijah was a good prayer, not to prove that Elijah was a true prophet, not to prove Elijah was anything special at all. God answered all of those prayers to prove that God is the one true living God. All right, and so that's kind of the that's kind of the story. That's kind of how the story goes. But what are some lessons that are that we can learn here? How can we follow Elijah's example and have our prayers answered? All right, so let's look at a couple of things about Elijah that uh, that we can emulate. That we can say, hey, you know what? That's that's one reason why he answered his prayer because. And uh, we've got several things here. First of all, um, Elijah. St- yeah, he, Elijah stood before the Lord, and um, and so, so in that that verse we read a few minutes ago, First Kings seventeen one, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. And that's an interesting phrase, but you, when you're standing before the Lord, you're standing before a judge, and so. Um, he's essentially um, submitting himself to judgment by God. And, uh, and that would be wise for all of us. I, I desire for God to judge me and to bring me to a place where I need to, uh, where I need to be in close fellowship with him. All right, so Elijah stood before the Lord. 
Then secondly, Elijah, you got several things you could guess here, right? <laughs> um, oh, obeyed. Yeah, he obeyed. He obeyed God. Looking particularly at 17, verse number 5, um, the Bible says, So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. Right? So God told him what to do, and he went and he did it. Uh, just, as, just as Moses uh, did, just as, um, just as Noah did, uh, God told him, and he went and did it. Okay? And uh, certainly for us, that's, that's a good thing to follow. Well, I'm just waiting for God to tell me. The problem with us is we already have what God wants us to do. Most of the time we just ignore it. Uh, we, we know from God's own word uh, what he desires of us. But we decide to go our own way. We think we have a better way, and uh, we we tend to ignore the word of God. But that is right. That is what God has uh, has given to us, and that we should obey. Um, number three in verse number uh, verse number sixteen, the Bible tells us that Elijah spoke. Yeah, he spoke for God. He was God's spokesman. And uh, if you remember from last week, that's one of the uh, one of the proofs of canonicity when the Bible was written by someone who was spoke for God was a was a spokesman of God. Um, verse number sixteen, chapter seventeen, verse sixteen, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. And so Scripture recorded for us here that Elijah was a true prophet of God. God speaking through um, God speaking through Elijah. And, uh, and and honestly, for us to learn this lesson, when's the last time we spoke for God? We know that God is not speaking audibly to uh, to people here any anymore. Um, when's the last time we spoke up for God on God's behalf uh, to share with them God's love, to share with them God's purpose, God's plan, um, or even to stand in. Um, in opposition of things that are not right and what God has declared to be uh, sin and wicked. Um, Elijah spoke for God. Number uh, number four here, Elijah cried. Yeah, Elijah cried unto God. One of these we've looked at already. He cried unto the Lord you know, there in verse number 20 and then actually many verses there. Where, uh, where he says he cried unto the Lord. And then number five, kind of right along that same line, Elijah had God's phone number, and so he, yes, he called on God. Mom got that one right away. <laughs> he called upon God. Uh, so we move to chapter 18, verse 24, and call ye on the name of your gods, I will call on the name of the Lord. And uh, so Elijah called on God. This one strikes me because typically, <clears throat> usually, if you're anything like me anyway, we want to try to figure some things out on our own and then wait wait till we can't figure it out anymore, till, <laughs> till we're absolutely done, we've exhausted every resource, and then we call on God. And, uh, and Elijah says, well, you can do whatever you want to. I'm. This is this is his very first action, right? To call on God, and uh, and so should uh, so should we. Uh, we should call upon God first, and um, let's see what God will do for us. All right. Uh, number six here, Elijah. Yeah, he sure did. He served God. Elijah served. God. Look at verse number 36, chapter 18, verse 36. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God and that I am thy servant. I am thy servant. Think about a servant not in this to make a name for himself. He's in here to serve. And he's in here, he's doing this not to become something great, someone of importance. He's there simply to serve God. Um, number seven there. Elijah, you've already mentioned it, but yeah, that one's that one's believed, right? I should have put these in alphabetical order. That would have helped you out. But uh, Elijah believed God. Uh, we say this this in verse number forty-one. Elijah came to Ahab 
get up, there's a, there's a sound of abundance of rain. Had it rained yet? No, not yet. But there is the, uh, there's a sound of abundance of rain. And, uh, and then finally, Elijah, how did he ask God? Repeatedly, absolutely. Elijah repeatedly asked God um, over and over and over again, right? So in, uh, in, in chapter 18, after the uh, false prophets have dispersed and everybody's gone their way, Elijah goes up to the mount and uh, begins to pray and ask God to make it rain once again. And uh, he sends his servant up uh, out onto the, onto, the, uh, onto the clearing and says, let me know when you, see, uh, when you see the clouds. And the servant went out and looked and said, nope. And he came back and said, no, not yet. And he said, do it again. And he went back, and he went back and forth several different times. The Bible says in verse 44, it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And, uh, and so, um, so Elijah was praying, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed until God answered. And, uh, and so these are... Some of the lessons that we can learn, we need to learn to stand before the Lord and uh, to be judged by God, allow God to inspect and search us. We need to obey God. We need to speak for God. We need to cry unto God. We need to call upon God. We need to serve God. We need to just believe Him. And then we need to continue after Him. Um, Kerry calls it being a, being God's stalker, right? Be persistent. Um, repeatedly ask for God uh, or ask God repeatedly. All right, so those are some lessons that we, uh, that, that, that we can learn. Let's look then finally at some principles that we can apply to our own life. What are some principles that we can apply to our own life? Yeah, so the Bible tells us what it takes to get God to answer our prayers, right? Throughout Scripture, there are conditions that God puts upon Him answering our prayers. And so we compile this, this list of things every time He says, if you do this, I'll answer. If you do this, I'll answer. If you pray this way, I'll answer. And so there's, there's some practical things that we can do um, in order to get our prayers answered. And of course, first, uh, first mention, live righteously. Right? Isaiah 59, we just looked at this on Sunday morning, right? In Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 2, he tells us very, very plainly, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So the problem was not with God's hearing. The problem was with the sin that was in their life. So, if, so, so when we apply this principle... So we want God to answer our prayers, but we don't want to live right. We want God to answer our prayers, but we don't want to put anything on our end, um, getting our life straightened out like God would have us to do. So the first principle we can apply here in getting our prayers answered is to, first off, live righteously. Live righteously. Secondly, according to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, um, secondly, we need to, prayer, to pray believing. We need to believe that God can and will answer our prayers. Um, Matthew 21, 22, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in, my, in prayer, believing ye shall receive. That word's not there on accident. That word's not there because he, it, it comes, it rolls off the tongue a little better. Um, ask in prayer, believing. When we come to, when we come to God with no faith, that He can answer our prayer, that He desires to answer the, uh, that our, our prayer, that He will answer our prayer. Um, it is a hindrance to having our prayer answered at all. Number three from Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, He gives us something very important to do if we want our prayers answered, and that is forgive. Forgive. Matthew chapter 6 he says, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. All right, and he's not talking about losing salvation. He's not talking about having everything squared away in your life before you can get saved. He's talking about this, 
um, having this the humility to seek forgiveness and to forgive others um, in order to have this right relationship with God and in order to have your prayers uh, prayers answered. Number four, we find a very interesting uh, little passage here in Luke 11, verses 5 through 10. And, uh, and the principle that we need to apply to, to our lives and to our prayer lives is to be... Um, we do need to do that, but later. We also need to be... Yeah, absolutely. Persistent. We need to be persistent. All right? In Luke chapter 11, we won't read the entire, uh, the entire thing, um, but essentially he said this, this guy comes at, at night and knocks on your door and you say, no, 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 go away. I'm, uh, I'm asleep. It's, it's already lights out, man. It's quiet hour. Uh, let's just go away. Just stay at it. And he, he doesn't leave. And he says, though he will, I say unto you, though he, will not, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And, uh, and so he likens this to that kind of having that kind of relationship with God where you are persistent in asking and uh, in, in, in asking God to meet your needs. Not persistent in your demands, but persistent in your asking God. All right. Uh, number five, keep God's word in your heart. Yeah, absolutely. Keep God's word in your heart. First John chapter three, verse twenty-two says this: "Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight." So John. Uh, of, of course, with this special relationship with the Lord Jesus personally, as when Jesus was here on this earth, John knows for sure what what's important to Jesus. You want to have a you, you want to have a relationship with Jesus that gets you what you're asking for. Keep His commandments. Do His word. Do those things that are pleasing in His sight. All right. Uh, number six. Don't go quickly, but <laughs> fast, yeah. Fasting. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 17, the disciples are, have a little bit of a quandary because they have, a, uh, they, they have an issue that they're not able to overcome. And uh, they, this, this person is possessed and uh, the disciples trying to, trying to cast out this demon and Jesus answered them this way in Matthew 17, 21. He says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so this is something that we, um, we need to take seriously and that we need to make important, and that is denying ourselves of our, even of our routinely, um, uh, routinely routine necessities so that we can focus in on our relationship with God and what God desires of us. All right? Everybody caught up thus far? Good? Yeah, we'll uh, clear the board. We'll continue then with letter G, pray in Jesus' name. Yeah, pray in Jesus' name. Jesus in His final discourse here with His disciples in John chapter 14 so whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, And that's more than just having a tagline of in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer. That is being in, uh, being in such communion with God and having a right relationship with God that you, um, that you are praying in uh, but praying in Jesus' name is also praying with His desires, thoughts, and will in, in mind. Kind of all-encompassing there with, uh, with that. Uh, next here was a 5, 6, 7, 8, number 8. Pray. Yes, absolutely. Pray secretly. Right? Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6. Jesus says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. 
And uh, when I was shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. Thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay, so uh, we're not praying to be seen. We're not praying to um, have men's man's recognition. We are praying, um, praying secretly for some uh, some things. And honestly, sometimes the the secret prayers are the ones that are that are most answered um, because we don't we don't desire for sometimes even giving prayer requests um, becomes a um, you know comes some sometimes like a competition you know like who needs the most prayer um, just pray secretly on some things and uh, and so a letter a letter I here uh, it's a number nine pray in God's yeah pray in God's will yeah pray in God's will James chapter four verse number three Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Um, so we must, we, we absolutely must recognize God's will in our prayers. And uh, not that, so this is not then, so this is the balancing of, of, of prayer life, right? We have, um, Jesus says, ask whatever you, whatever you ask, ask in my name, I'll do it. And then he says, but, but not just because you want it done. <laughs> Um, ask in my name, I'll do it when it is God's will. And so we have these balancing um, principles here to apply to our life. And then number 10, be, yes, yes, we have to be humble. Uh, Luke 18 is, uh, Jesus gives us this account of the Pharisee and the publican that go to pray. And, uh, and let's see what he says here about the, the publican. The publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went uh, down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And so, in our, so even in our prayer life, we should be humble. Again, that same idea, we're not asking God, we're not making demands of God. We're not um, expecting God to do it because we asked and we are His child and we are, you know, uh, anything special. We need to remember our place and we need to be humble. All right. Um, but next year, number 11, pray. It is. It's pray early. Pray early. Um, Proverbs eight seventeen says, "I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me." And uh, there is no indication in Scripture that this is necessarily talking about a time of day. Praise the Lord for that. Um, but uh, but instead, the idea of of early being as soon as as soon as possible and as soon as it's needed, um, it should be our first option. Uh, to pray to God, and uh, should be, you know, and of course we take the first opportunity to pray to God, but it should also be our first option uh, to pray to God. All right, so pray early, and then lastly, number twelve, one that might surprise you a minute: go soul winning. Go soul winning. All right, John chapter fifteen, verse sixteen. Jesus says this: "Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit." And that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So Jesus makes this direct connection between us going and bringing forth fruit and having our prayers answered. Um, and so this is what's, so in essence you could say Jesus is saying, Go, if you do what is important to me, I will do what is important uh, for you. Yeah, so go forth and bring forth fruit, all right? Everybody all caught up? We all done? All right, very good. Um, our memory verse for this week is Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse number 3, where he says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. All right? Very, very good. All right, any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, conditions?
Yeah. Yeah, we've got to ask. Yeah, and he'll do it. I know we kind of rushed through that because we kind of got a little bit of a later start, uh, got a little bit behind on time-wise, but um, but we made it through. So, very good. <laughs> right, right. You try to try to figure it out on your own anyway. Um, so yeah, there's a. There's a lot of things that we that we do that way. So, all right. Well, let's let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we do thank you again so much for the opportunity, Lord, to study your word and to and to consider some of these things that you've set before us. And uh, Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us as we consider this truth, this promise that you've given to us, that if we will call upon you and our heart is right with you and we have that right relationship with you and uh, that you'll hear our prayers, that you hear us, and you know us. And uh, Lord, I pray that it would be an encouraging thought for us tonight, that we, would, um, that we would humble ourselves to stand before you, and that we would allow you uh, full control, full access to our hearts. And Lord, convict us of some things that need to change, give us strength to make whatever changes are needed, and uh, we will be certain to, uh, to honor and to glorify and to please you. Lord, we love you tonight. We pray that you would use us and, uh, and draw us close to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very good. In his name. Absolutely. All right. God bless you. You're dismissed.